All right, so I know many of you have been asking, when do I use all these heat relationship equations? And so I'm calling this so much heat, so let's talk about heat and heat exchange and how we identify which of the tools we have so far, okay? So let's first start up here by saying, what is heat, right? We said heat is the transfer of kinetic energy, okay? So we know that's true. Now there's multiple ways something can transfer kinetic energy, okay? One of those is it undergoes a temperature change, okay? So now for something to undergo a temperature change and release or absorb heat, what we notice here is that as it undergoes this temperature change, whatever that is, is that that object remains the same chemical identity. So it means we're not forming something new. It means we have a piece of copper, that copper is increasing temperature or decreasing in temperature. We have water, <clears throat> that water is increasing in temperature or decreasing in temperature. But that copper is not reacting to form copper oxide, or that water is not reacting to form hydroxide. Okay, so it's something remaining constant, it doesn't change what it is. Well, if we just have something remaining constant, doesn't change what it is, the way that we identify how much heat it transfers, right, from that change in temperature, right? And that's because we have a change in our average kinetic energy of that specific object, is that we would say, well, there's one of two circumstances that we could use when our object remains the same. We could say, well, if I have information about that object related to its mass, its specific heat capacity, and its change in temperature, I can quantify how much heat it absorbs or releases. All right, so we need to know mass, specific heat capacity, okay? And typically we use something along these lines when we have something that is pure, okay? So it's not a heterogeneous mixture. We don't know, we know that it's all copper or it's a solution that is um, water and sodium and nitrate ions, okay? So it's a mixture that is pure. We can think about it as being uh, homogeneous. So if we have that circumstance, we can look at, if I took a gram of it here and a gram of it here, it's gonna absorb or release heat the same. Whereas if we have something that we, we don't know, like our bomb calorimeters, it's some metal, some water, some insulator, uh, some oxygen, some gas, we would say, well, the heat released or absorbed here is equal to the heat capacity times the change in temperature. And so now this heat capacity is mass dependent or amount dependent and it's taken into consideration the whole of the object, how much heat will it absorb or release when it undergoes a temperature change, okay? And so here we typically use this when it's heterogeneous or we don't know what it is, right? If we don't know what it is, we can't identify its specific heat. We can't look it up in a table and figure out that it's water if we don't know it's water, okay? So these are really important tools that we can use when we're looking at heat transfer when the temperature change occurs, okay? Now we have another way that we can change or transfer kinetic energy, and that's where we have an exchange of potential energy to kinetic energy, okay? So this occurs when we undergo a reaction, okay? So in order for us to change our chemical potential energy, convert it to kinetic or absorb kinetic and form uh, increase our chemical potential, potential energy, we must have a reaction occur. Okay, so in this circumstance, what we'll see is we have a change in what is present in our system. Okay, so there's not, this, not the same chemical identity. Okay, so example here, we take methane, we add oxygen, we combust it, we no longer have methane and oxygen, we now have carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so we've undergone a reaction. So we can't use this same idea here and say, well, it's changing temperature. That's causing kinetic energy to be released or absorbed. No, we have an, ex an exchange of kinetic and potential energies, okay? So now the ways that we can quantify this exchange of chemical and potential energy is through two different relationships. One of them, let's go ahead and separate this out here. One of them would be where we'd say, well, the Q that I release or absorb, and this is for our reaction, 
Okay, so for our system, right, we're talking about our, the point of our system is equal to the change in internal energy of our system. Okay, well this is going to be true when work is equal to zero. Okay, so the only way we can say that the only way we change in internal energy is when we release or absorb heat is if work is equal to zero. Okay, well the time that this is true is where we have a constant volume situation, right? And that would be our examples of our bomb calorimeters. So specifically in bomb calorimeters, the heat that I measure for my reaction is equal to my internal energy change. Now the other more typical exchange of heat that we would see is where we'd say the Q of my reaction is equal to the change in enthalpy. Okay, and we can say this is true when work per se is not equal to zero. So we're not trying to figure out the actual amount of work being produced, whether it's consumed as adding energy to the system or released as uh, energy going into the surroundings. <coughs> and this is where we have the ability for our volume to expand or contract. We can do expansion work, but we have constant pressure. And this is where we have a coffee cup calorimeter or pretty much every type of reaction that's open to the environment because we can expand or contract but the volume the pressure excuse me will remain constant okay now how do these two talk to each other like how does it make sense that they relate to each other okay well these two relate to each other when we are actually going to have a reaction cause a change in temperature okay so we see here we have a reaction cause a change in temperature. So for example, we have a coffee cup calorimeter. Okay, in our coffee cup calorimeter, we have that coffee cup calorimeter transfer its kinetic energy into or from our solution. Okay, so what we're doing here is we say we have a reaction where its change in potential energy is causing a change in temperature to occur by what's what right around it, the surroundings. Okay, so we're always going to have the circumstance where something's gaining or losing heat. Now, how we quantify that gain or loss or heat is different depending on if it's a reaction or not a reaction. And this all goes back to the fact that we can say the amount of heat gained by one is equal and opposite to the amount of heat lost by the other. Right? This will always be true for our heat transfer because it abides by the law of the first law of thermodynamics, this idea of conservation of energy. If my reaction is losing energy and giving away kinetic energy, my surroundings, my solution, if we're talking about coffee cup calorimetry, is absorbing that energy. And so that's where we can, when we're talking about heat transfer, we can always go back to this. Now the ways we actually identify how we quantify those amounts of heat depends on if it's a temperature change or if it's a reaction and a change in potential energy causing us to get to amount of heat release based upon the internal energy change or the heat release based upon the enthalpy change. So hopefully this helps us identify and navigate when do we use these relationships and these equations. Okay, so again if you have questions please come see me because we're going to continue to use these relationships throughout this semester.